Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, friends, a hugely warm welcome to 2030 Insight Live. Welcome. <laughs> we made it from the four corners of the earth, and at last we made it to Singapore. And haven't we been made to feel so welcome here, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, we have. <laughs> my name is Ollie Barrett, and it's my great honor to be your moderator, your master of ceremonies for the next couple of days. A hugely warm welcome if you're here in the room in Singapore, and if you're joining us online or catching up a bit later on. What an extraordinary range of guests we have. Let's count some of the people here. Eye health leaders, public health experts and professionals, chief executives, representatives of health ministries, ophthalmologists, optometrists, and eye health professionals by the dozen. If I haven't counted you yet, you're very welcome as well. We're also joined by colleagues and friends who are streaming in from homes or offices around the world in dozens of different countries or catching up, and we want you to feel especially welcome. So please let us know your questions and your comments as we go through the day as well. And of course, we've got plenty of time to meet each other here in Singapore. Because 2030 Insight Live is really where conversations start and where they continue from Dubai. I have a show of hands if you were in Dubai last year, yes? Welcome back. Thank you for being here again in person. This is where actions are going to be set and plans are going to be made. That's the point of being here as well. Because, and you'll hear this again and again, the end of avoidable blindness is within our grasp. The opportunity of accessible, affordable, available eye care for eye health has never been closer, and yet challenges will still remain. So, we're here today against the backdrop of a new strategy. We'll hear all about that for eye health. It's ambitious and it's built on a very, very solid foundation. And we'll hear lots about that and about how you experience the world as we spend our time together. We are absolutely delighted to be here at SERI, the Singapore Eye Research Institute based at the Singapore National Eye Center. So can I just say on behalf of everybody, IAPB, all of our guests, a huge thank you. Why don't we put our hands together to our amazing hosts here for making us so welcome. You don't need me to remind you that we are in one of the world's state-of-the-art and leading eye research institutes, and we're very grateful to the teams for making us feel welcome. So what better way to start to welcome us to Singapore, but also to tell us a little bit about this fantastic world-class institute and what it does, please welcome up from SERI, Professor Jodbir Mehta. Welcome. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Oli. So, uh, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, ambassadors, uh, Caroline Casey, IPB President, Baba Qureshi, Vice President, uh, Deborah Davis, Treasurer IPB, and Peter Holland, uh, IPB C, uh, CEO. Colleagues, friends, and really fellow healthcare workers, all of you in the room today. It's my great pleasure to be here in person and not as a robot. And, uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction into SERI, and we're very pleased to basically be able to host the IPB meeting in uh, Singapore uh, this year. I'm particularly pleased to welcome Ambassador Webson, because when I heard he's from Antigua, um, I went to vi visit Antigua. If any of you haven't been there, I'd urge you to go and visit. It's a beautiful island. But as a young person growing up in the UK, I was a great cricket fan. And unfortunately, when England used to tour the West Indies in the 80s and 90s, they used to get absolutely slaughtered by the West Indian pace attack. And there was a very famous quote from an English cricketer, some of you may know, called David Gower. He said, how would you describe the Caribbean? He said, the Caribbean is a beautiful place to go. Just don't play any cricket while you're there. <laughs> so. SERI has had a long and established reputation and link with basically IPB, really since basically 2011. And this has really been a strong foundation for our work in basically Singapore Eye Research Institute. And IPB in this collaboration has been the foundation for several of our community health basically programs. And I'm just gonna show you two of these. Uh, one was basically the setting up of the um, SRDP or diabetic basically screening program. And this is basically uses funders photography done at, in the polyclinic level in basically Singapore. 
And the idea was to basically leverage on the telecare system in Singapore to allow analysis. And now this is done basically with some of the AI technology uh, basically going forward. And, now, and, and to allow a faster imaging and grading and assessment of patients undergoing diabetic uh, care in uh, Singapore. And this is now basically put out all around the whole island, as you can see, uh, basically from this graphic over here. And it has had a significant improvement in basically monitoring of diabetes and diabetic eye care. And I know this is one of the major uh, things with IAPB we're basically following up. The other area has been the implementation of this really on the ground, and you can see in the middle over there in 2012, we did this with actually a bus service uh, as well, and then we basically expanded this to other polyclinics from a really basic polyclinic basic level and showed that you're able to deliver high level quality screening all the way from on the ground community level all the way up to basically tertiary referral uh, services. The other big, basically, development that we've been working with IPBB on is basically myopia. We know that basically myopia has really become the new pandemic. Over 50% of the world are going to be basically myopic by the time we reach basically 2050. And myopia per se, of course, is not the major problem. But what is the major problem is the high myopia, and that's almost going to basically be a billion of the population. The idea basically through some of the programs and some of the research that was done in SERI was the development of low dose atropine. And you can see now through the whole of Southeast Asia where really uh, myopia rates have really risen in Singapore, it's almost 85% of the population who are basically myopic. And we can retard the basically the development of myopia. So instead of having those cases of very high myopia above minus 10, we can limit this down to basically minus four, minus five. And now the drug, this drug has been now basically licensed to several areas throughout the whole of Southeast Asia and just recently got approval basically for the U. Um, in uh, China as well. Now, SERI has also basically changed since 2011. We've had a change in basically uh, leadership. Tin Yim was the executive director at that time. Uh, Ong Tin, who some of you recently met yesterday, was our executive director, and then I took over from him as executive director uh, last year. But really, Arthur Lim basically established the institute um, in, in 1997, and the ethos of translational research, improving patients' vision and improving patient care, really runs throughout all the executive directors that we basically had. We all have a different clinical portfolio. Mine is cornea and uh, lasers. Uh, tin obviously being glaucoma, tin yin basically being retina as well. And we try to basically focus our strategy on research into translation so we can basically help our patients and actually see real effects of our research work in basically patient outcomes. SERI has grown tremendously over the years. Um, this is the cumulative, basically, amount in its basically almost 24 or 5 years uh, since inception. And of course, we have to be competitive with our research, and this allows us to basically attract funding both nationally and basically also internationally. And of course, when some of the measures of the outputs of SERI's achievements have put us in the sort of leading in the world with respect to some of the academic uh, collaborations and publications that we have uh, with, with from this paper from Europe, showed that basically 90% of papers published in Singapore come from SERI or basically SNEC, and, and SERI was ranked number one in the world uh, with respect to impact factor uh, per million inhabitants per year with respect to publications in ophthalmology as well. So this is really uh, a testimony to all the researchers, uh, both clinical and basically scientific research in SNEC and SERI as well. Of course, that's just the academic side, but the real value is in the commercialization and the development of products from research all the way to clinic. And we, this was established in 2015 with our in, industry and uh, technology department in uh, SERI. And we focused on this to really get our research out into the community and out to Bay City patients where we can actually have some big dramatic effect itself. And this is really developed, and you can see some of the things that have basically been developed from there. Myopine, the drug for atropine at the top. There's been uh, uh, devices that were used for corneal transplantation. They were some of the first devices approved by the FDA. Uh, Selena is an AI device used for di diabetic screening, and Plano is a device basically used for myopia control. And this is something that we've actively done, and certainly we've been ahead of the community uh, in Singapore to get our research into patients and getting them into basically patient outcomes. And you can see we have a whole pipeline of things basically coming forward. And this is to really inspire our juniors and our residents to basically that they can actually make a much bigger impact than just their standard basically clinical work uh, going forward. So we're finally here. Uh, I want to also acknowledge the organizers of the program for the IAPB meeting. Of course, it's taken this program and implementation has taken several years. As many of you will know, it was delayed from basically 2020 and we had something called the pandemic crisis basically going on through there itself. 
But as we know, when often when we're in a crisis, this can often lead to innovation. And generally, we all come out stronger after basically a crisis situation. And we can see that in some of the discussions on teleophthalmology, uh, digital imaging, and also basically in the developments in, in cell therapy as well. I want to congratulate the organizing committee for organizing a well-balanced, both with respect to gender and diversity, from all the program speakers that I was able to basically see as well. And I want to also want to uh, acknowledge my team in SERI and SNEC for all the organization for to be able to get this event basically off the ground. There's several highlights, I think, on the program. I don't want to like, I'll just pick out a few. I mean, I, obviously, I love the topics of basically the fast changing world and looking into the future. It's important when we're looking at planning, especially financial planning, if we can see where things are basically happening, both basically locally, but also from global trends. I love the topic of love your eyes and obviously climate change and technology for access is key and is really important because I think many by using implementation of technology, we can actually skip some of the advancements that have taken many generations to basically occur, uh, occur basically going forwards. There are over 300 delegates in this room, so I think that's congratulations again to the organizing committee for organizing a fantastic program from over 50 companies, uh, 15 co 50 countries. And I also want to thank you because I know traveling now has become a lot more expensive, and you've made a massive effort to come to basically Singapore. And I looked on the website and it said it's a sold out event. So I appreciate your time to come and spend time with us in Singapore. And really, the time is to really network and basically talk to each other face to face. You don't have to worry about mute button now because everyone's sitting basically in the same room. So in conclusion, I really want to just sort of uh, sum up in the fact that, you know, this won't be the last crisis that we will basically all face probably in our generation or certainly in the generations going forward as well. But history tells us that we will basically survive any crisis and also we will basically be stronger from that crisis as well. And that's through innovation and communication to so take action be connected, and talk face to face. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, George. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Meta. Why don't we have another big round of applause for Professor Meta and all of his colleagues. Thank you. And we've got a huge amount to learn uh, from the team, including in the UK, uh, about air conditioning. So thank you very much for keeping us inspired and keeping us cool as well. Thank you for the canter through the program as well, uh, Professor. You can be my wingman anytime. That was very helpful. Good plug for the Love Your Eyes campaign. One of my campaigning heroes, James Chen, Jen Chen in the audience as well. You're going to hear so much about uh, some of the work of the partners and members of IAPB over the next couple of days. Very good to see colleagues from the WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, in the room today and tuning in with their support as well. Uh, we're very honored to say that the Director General uh, himself, uh, Tedros Adhanom Hebreesus, has sent us this message of goodwill. Let's have a look. Ambassador Aubrey Webson, President Caroline Kasi, Professor Jod Mehta, dear colleagues and friends. The loss of eyesight is a tragedy, but when it happens, despite being preventable, it's an outrage. Only one out of six people in need of cataract surgery and one third of people in need of spectacles have access to the care they need. Nearly all these people live in low-income countries or communities. The WHO, the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness, and our partners are working together with countries around the world to address the massive unmet needs for eye care. In 2020, the World Health Assembly committed to addressing preventable vision impairment and blindness. A year later, the United Nations also passed a resolution linking eye health to the Sustainable Development Goals. WHO is currently supporting 15 member states through the implementation of the WHO Eye Care Guide for Action to build more sustainable and integrated eye care services. We are also establishing the WHO SPECS 2030 initiative to support member states to increase access to spectacles. Thank you all for your continued commitment to building a world where every person has the opportunity to see clearly. I thank you. Thank you to the Director General and to all of his colleagues here uh, today. Right, onwards. Um, my next introduction is for someone who actually needs uh, very little introduction, 
Uh, you will almost certainly know Caroline Casey already. Uh, she's a businesswoman, she's an activist, she's a campaigner. Her day job, or certainly one of them, is as chief executive of the Valuable 500, a formidable organization. I mean it as the highest compliment when I say she is restless in her constant pursuit of making a positive difference. To us today, we're proud to say she is, of course, the president of IAPB. Please give a huge welcome to Caroline Casey. <laughs> Let me double check. Here we go. Let's keep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can shout. I'm Irish. Here we go. I'm going to push the magic button. Here we go. Coming on. I'm not going to give it to you until I'm happy. Well, I <laughs> Night of the Opera. There you go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And good morning, everybody online as well. Um, gosh, I. Just a moment, I just, let's get into the room. Let's just be here. And why are we all here? To do that huge work that we want to see to end avoidable sight loss requires so many things, requires so much skills from so many different sectors, from academia, from working on the ground, from ophthalmology, from WHO, for human beings who are activists and campaigners, from optometrists, for delivering services right throughout the world. It requires our brains and the system change work and all the processes. Mostly, mostly it requires our intention and our hearts. And as the president today, I want to talk a little bit about that heart of ours. You can see we have the heart as our logo for love your eyes. Let's never underestimate this. The heart of what we do. The heart of what we are here for. And as a person who has severe vision loss and is registered blind, I kind of want to make a point. I want the lights to drop, please. Completely. I'm an all or nothing. Hi. <laughs> Hello, I am your human disco ball. They won't be able to play the song that I wanted, which was A Sky Full of Stars by Coldplay. But I kind of want to make a point rather than looking ridiculous. And this shows you how much I absolutely love the work we do and how much I believe in every single light on this Christmas tree. There's a reason for it, other than making you laugh, which is good, because I'm glad I'm making you laugh. It's because often in darkness, light is so contagious. Have you ever swam in a sea and shook the water and saw bioluminescence or phosphorescence? It's like the diamonds fell out of the sky. And it's so beautiful. It's like all that hope. And for somebody who has low vision, as I do, I love disco lights. I love the twinkle of a light. And actually, Singapore does it better than anybody. Actually, we've just ended the light festival here. You can start bringing up the lights so I don't look like a disco ball anymore. <laughs> but I, the reason I believe so much in this idea of a fairy light. You can bring up the lights, it's okay. <laughs> Is because I want, I'm gonna do this all the time in the dark, haven't I? <laughs> you can now bring up the lights. <laughs> Aha, here we are. But the reason I use this as something, and we talk about the heart, here is the power that lights these lights around my body. It's the plug. It's the over one billion people who give us the energy, the electricity, and the power to keep doing this work. Every light represents 
every organization, every human being that is fighting and advocating and agitating and building and improving and challenging, every single light on a global, a global Christmas tree light. And what are we, what's this wire in between? This is the IAPB, and this is why we're in the room. It's the line that connects us. This is our power. Yes, your individual work and your individual passion and your individual hearts are so important. But together, drawn together by this wire, is they can't ignore us anymore. How can you ignore that? That contagious, powerful light drawn together. We may have different ways of doing what we believe, but together, together they can't not see us. Sometimes you don't see one light fighting and shouting and hoping, but you cannot ignore the light that lights all of us around the world. You can't. And that's why I'm here. And that's why we're here. Because we all believe that not only does ending avoidable sight matter, of course it matters. We don't need to say that to each other. We call it the blind spot in the world, the secret. Well, this is not a secret anymore. There's one thing worse than being bullied is to be invisible. Well, this is not going to be invisible any longer. We're here because it's solvable. We know what to do. We know what to do. And now with technology, we can scale what to do probably quicker and faster. The world is more aware because of COVID, because we've used our eyes more than ever before. We know what to do, and we can, but we can't do it on our own. And we can't compete with other issues. It's not a scarcity model. If we give to eyes, we take away from the environment. It's not like that, it's integrating it. We're in this moment of hyper collaboration, this revolution of radical collaboration. We don't need to compete with each other. We've got to leave the egos and the roles at the door and use that heart we all have for what we want is a world that everybody belongs, everybody is seen, and everybody is heard, and no one person is more important than another. And the momentum for that is building. You can feel it, come on, for those of you who've been working this space for decades, can't you feel it? You can. You can feel it. It's like that zeitgeist moment. It's just the flavor of it just starting to tickle around when you know we're coming into that light, bringing all of our power. We welcomed in this year 19 new members into the IAPB. And can I give a round of applause, please? Welcome, 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 welcome. And for those of you who are old timers, I don't mean an age, make sure that you welcome them. Make sure that there's nobody standing alone who doesn't want to stand alone. The momentum is here. The IAPB has won for the international and European membership organizations. We won membership organization of the year and campaign of the year. It is being recognized. And can I just say, because it's the team and it's the people who've been working, and it's all of you giving your extra hours of 18-hour days and giving your attention and your time, because it matters. And again, why are we here? Well, I wanted to end with something personal. I have just come back from being away in Greece, where I locked myself away for 10 days. People can't believe that I would shut up talking for 10 days, but I did because I was trying to make a decision. And I was in a Greek island and, you know, I can't drive cars, obviously, and I shouldn't cycle bikes. But the walk down to the village was getting longer and longer and longer, and it was getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And I saw that there was electric bikes. 
Yeah. And I went and I read the form, and it said, are you fit and healthy enough to ride a bicycle? Yes, technically, I am fit and healthy enough to ride a bicycle. I didn't tell them that I was registered blind. So I ticked the box, I got on the bike, made sure there was no traffic around of people and humans, and I got on this electric bike. And I can't actually tell you the feeling of being able to independently move. I thought I was flying when I put the power on. I must have been the happiest grinning human being on that island, bombing my way around absolutely illegally, loving every part that I was doing. And the reason I say this from this point of privilege, an Irish middle-class woman with a great education, if I hadn't had access to eye health and eye care, I wouldn't be standing here. But look what it gave me, that chance on that bicycle to go, ah, sure, I'm just gonna do it anyway. But that freedom of independence, that it broke open my heart. And you know, when I thought I was coming here, is that's what we're here to do, to release the potential, the freedom, and the ability of every single person that we can. So I want to thank you for being in the room. Open your hearts, open your curiosity, drop our egos, bring our brains, and enjoy this moment with each other. And just each and every one of you remember, as an individual, what you do matters. It really matters. But when we join us up together, we're gonna blow this up. Thank you so very much. Now, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome onto the stage my absolute crush. And leading to the crush, it is Ambassador Webson and his wonderful wife, Mrs. Webson, whose wedding anniversary it is today. So can we give them a massive round of applause? <laughs> woo -woo! Ambassador, would you like to have my disco lights? Oh, good, you never know. <laughs> thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you, and thank you very much to, for the greetings. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, distinguished guests. Before I, I proceed, let me sing that um, my dear friend Caroline let the big, let the secret that wasn't a secret out about my my our anniversary. Let me say on behalf, you know, the last time I, I uttered these words was 35 years ago. On behalf of my wife and I, let me say thank you. <laughs> now I say on behalf of Rosemary, my wife and I. And there's one person in the room who was with us 35 years ago, and I want to acknowledge her, uh, Victoria Sheffield. She was my photographer. <laughs> Now, friends, this is a very important moment, and I am delighted to be here at this Singapore National Eye Institute, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Mehta, Judd, um, the executive director for his remarks, and for leading this great institution and the success that this, this institution has had, not only as an institution, but in the lives of so many. 2030, Inside Live, is the only annual gathering of, of um, the entire eye health sector, and we are all delighted to be here together. It's a privilege to be um, hosted by the um, Singapore Eye Institute, and, and to acknowledge the, the work that they have done um, throughout, throughout the globe in, in this field. Um, Singapore, as a, as a country, as you know, started uh, mainly as a sort of a hub for shipping and its contribution to the world as, as it was used as 
this, the, in, the, in the street as this major hub, and it has transformed a small island into a dynamic place. From its very um, early contem contemporary foundings, what, just over 100 years ago in 1819 through to today, this multicultural um, small island state is, is, has remained a focus point um, in, in its position and has created it for itself a global position in innovation and a global position. Singapore's National Eye Institute and the Singapore Eye Research um, Institute uh, it exemplifies that Singaporean spirit of innovation and, and success through the, their pioneering work in, in, in my, dealing with um, myopia. The research institute has transformed and changed the lives of many. I feel that I'm a little close to the mic because I'm hearing a boom each time I speak. <laughs> the facility we find ourselves in here today is, um, um, typifies this, the innovative spirit of Singapore and the kind of innovation that we need to take on next in our field. Our engagement with the eye health sector demonstrates by the, the long and deep relationship with IAPB that this, that this institute and joining this organization is the road that we need to walk if we are to fulfill our, our, our wish to transform the lives. Thank you to Caroline, as I said at the beginning, for your introduction, and it's always so good to be with you. Now, colleagues, friends, we're gathered to discuss vision and eye health and the progress we have made and the goals we are striving towards. Yet, we cannot look at our goals and our, ch and, and our challenges on their own or simply be look amongst our own field. Often when we come to conferences, we are, as they say, preaching to the choir, we're speaking to each other. I want you to think, think and open up because I want to challenge you. We're living in a world which is being um, sort of remade after COVID-19 pandemic. We often speak of now pre and post COVID. You know, I was speaking to somebody and said, when last were you in Singapore? So, uh, 2018 or 2019, and the first time I came, then they say, oh, pre-COVID or pre-pandemic. So yeah, I didn't think of it that way, but I guess that's the way. And now people speak of post-pandemic. So the pace of change we are, exp we are experiencing is, is, is fast, is so much. Uh, that, uh, that the global change we in this eye care sector must keep up. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is still being felt. Health workforce around the world is still struggling to recover from the pandemic. You know, huge pressures of, uh, uh, and face, we face trauma during that period, We're trying to cope with the, the virus and we are still in recovery mode. We are still in the early stages of, of absorbing the lessons that we learned from scientific progress and the global collaboration that brought about uh, the, 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 the breakthrough in coping with the pandemic. We are still trying to learn from how we developed the vaccine so quickly and how we were able to make global use of this, in this tool so that we can all be back here where we want to be. Many of us are adapting to change, working, and be, uh, working behavior to change and working behaviors have changed and we are trying to understand and adopt to that. Many people are still working from home where the workplace is not the same place it was and we are all trying to adapt. Um, friends, we, we, this adaptation is not about individuals only, it's about organizations and the, and the, the impact that our, on, on, on personal lives. It's about, of course, 
not, not only the organizations, but it impacts the new thinking about healthcare and particularly the new thinking about eye care. Our globalized world is adapting to the impacts on, 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 on supply chains and delivery mechanisms as we consider how our intercon interconnectiveness co connectivityness can be both a strength and a weakness. In the face of a pandemic, we are, we are really trying to learn the lessons that will take us forward. As the professor said just now, this is not going to be the last of this kind that we would have seen in, in our generation and in generations to come. The pandemic transformed our lives and has done so forever. Yet, colleagues, we are also facing more transformational changes. The pandemic is, 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 the pandemic is only one thread in the tapestry of our, of our, our fast-changing fast world. The escalating effects of climate change urgently, urgently needs demand our, and, and demand our global attention. The climate change demands our attention in all aspects of our lives to be, and if we're going to find sustainable solutions. An annual average of 21.5 million people are forcibly displaced each year by weather-related events. I know, I know that because I come from a part of the world that is most vulnerable to climate change. Regional conflicts persist with significant impacts on global stability and contributing to the crisis we are all facing today in, in, in migration. The resulting global economic slowdown is impacting inflation and income levels in all countries of all income groups, whether you're middle, high, or low income. These compounding global challenges are significant, and we got to find answers. And the most vulnerable people in our societies are those who are the most impacted by these significant changes and challenges that we face. Yet we are also seeking a new understanding of cap and, 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 and for capacity of resilience and innovation. We are seeing how the, how the resilient spirit of individuals face these challenges and rise. There is more, more global connect connectivity than ever. The, the exchange of information amongst individuals, amongst countries, amongst people are far more effective than ever. It's, and it's moving at an unprecedented pace. We have seen how this, so how, we have seen how this su supports new ways of engaging communities and enabling us as people to play a role in seeing and, and creating new possibilities for how we can live and live sustainably as a human race, as communities. These challenges have forced us and brought us in many ways closer together. We are also seeing changes in, 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 so, in societal and cultural norms. And increased awareness and, and activism is, is, is combined with deep and challenging, combined with deep and challenging conversations amongst professionals, amongst all levels of people within society. Care systems the world over are now reorienting themselves to be more patient-centered 
in their approaches and striving to, to integrate um, previously separate disciplines uh, working together in order to provide better health care and indeed stronger and better eye health care. These developments are, of course, supported by huge technology advancements. And I think, for me, this is where we need to focus a lot of our attention going forward if we are to reach the levels of change that we want, technology. The shifts this year in the field of AI are of particular note, specifically in healthcare and in its, pot its potential in analysis and diagnostics. All these changes are breathtaking in, in their speed. And we, in this field, as a sector, we need to face, we need to face many risks if we are, to, if we are to, to, to be engaged. We need to be, if we are to be successful, we need to begin to step faster into the innovative world, into the world of innovation and, be, and, and take the risk that confronts us. Critically, we face an acceleration of the, of the problem we are striving to, to address. We, 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 we learned how fast the problems of myopia is. We, we are understanding the numbers of persons who are faced with the possibility of sight loss increasing. Multiple life cycle factors are contributing, you see, to an explosion in a range of these eye health challenges and conditions that we face. Um, for example, the epidemic of myopia will have a particular impact on children and young adults. In many of the countries in this region, over two thirds of young people have myopia by the time they leave school. I did a small exercise last fall in my own island in Antigua, working with IAPB and the on-site group from out of the United States, Vision Springs and that group. And we did, in, in, in my community, we carried out um, some eye screening and almost two thirds of the children and in screen needed glasses and didn't know. One young man, when he received a new pair of glasses, went back into the classroom and he was, uh, he said, I didn't know that you had pictures above the board. I didn't know that was Viv Richards. And these were his, that's his hero. He didn't know that. He was standing below the picture of Viv Richards. The increase in numbers is not just in, in, your, in this region. It is, I have just pointed out, in Antigua. In Africa, the trend is significant. The trend has increased since 2010 by, by um, doubled in, in, since, since in, in only 13 years. Young people with myopia will need ongoing eye health and eye care services to manage and manipulate their environment and to, to prevent greater problems down the road. Our health systems and eye care services are not yet in a position to respond to this significant challenge. And we face, we face falling behind if our goals, falling behind our goals unless we understand and embrace these challenges and the changes that we must undertake. Uh, we need to seek opportunities that, uh, that present themselves to us. Out of every challenge is an opportunity. Because the opportunities are great, we have an opportunity before us to collaborate both within and outside of the eye health sector 
demonstrating the key role that eye health plays in, 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 in so many facets of social and economic progress. We need to see eye health beyond healthcare. We need to see eye health into the realm of development. We have an opportunity to harness the re recommendations from the recent global commitment and drive progress at a national level. We have an opportunity to further develop our understanding to gathering and sharing data and, and, and evidence, making a clear case for the importance of eye health globally. We have an opportunity, friends, to raise awareness, to advocate, and to campaign on multiple levels and on many fronts in multiple domains, making eye health something that is universally understood as a core part of health and well-being and a core part of national and international development. We have this opportunity to embrace technology, to, to, to integrate and harness AI, uh, telemedicine, mobile health applications to import, to Im to, to prove that eye health is, 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 is significant and that we can use it to uh, overcome our problems. If we grasp these opportunities that laid out before us, we can improve access to services. We can integrate eye, eye care into universal health care. We can make eye health a significant driver in national development. Our systems must be and should invest into early treatment. We must invest in using technology as the driver. Because the biggest risk that we face to, um, is if we fail to embrace these opportunities. The biggest risk we face is not to take the risk. We know that 1.1 billion people live in avoid, live, uh, are now living with avoidable sight loss. And that of these, most of these people, 90% live in lower and middle income countries or environment. We know this. And we know that women, rural populations, those with low income, older people, persons with disability, ethnic groups, and, 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 and persons who have come from the lower, lower levels of society, we know that they're the ones most likely to f not to receive services. We know where they are, we know whom they are, and we must reach them. The opportunities before us are immense, but the change we experience can only be positive if it is positive for everybody, it must not be for few. Leaving no one behind must be taken seriously. The end of avoid, avoid, avoidable sight loss by 2030 may sound ambitious, may seem to be an aspiration, but you know, I believe we can make a major Dent, I believe we can get there. To do this, we are trying and must continue to try to achieve. In this, it's about population change. It's about creating the kind of change that has not been seen for years. Achieving such a change in a way that is sustainable is only possible if our work is grounded in, the, in, in, in equity. So everybody leaving no one behind. If leaving no one behind is the, is the framework for what we do, that change is possible. The world has changed so much in the last three years. 
we cannot imagine what other changes lie ahead between now and 2030. But we can imagine how we can reach the goals that we have. We can imagine what our change must be. And as Caroline would say, we can be a dangerous dreamer and make that dream come true. We can learn from what we are experiencing now, from how we are um, rising to this challenge and meeting these, change, these challenges, and we can seize the opportunities before us. We are here for the next two days to do just that, to share information, to discuss how we as individuals, how our organizations, how the sector can work together to bring about this change. We are here to build co co coalitions and to collaborate. We are here to share knowledge and to share it generously. We are here to bring about the change that we all want. And I would flip Helen Keller's um, um, quote on its head and say, we are here because we have a vision to give sight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Webson. Uh, prior to today, ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Webson and I had only met in Zoom land <laughs> in the online world. And I know I speak for all of our honored guests here when we say thank you for the work you do, that you continue to do, the founder of the Friends of Vision Group at the UN, and for being here in three dimensions and in person. Why don't we hear it once again for Ambassador Webson? Thank you, sir. Now, if you, if you stay with us, sir, and um, we'll ask you to join us for the next few moments. See your chair in front of you here. And I'm actually going to ask to join us up here uh, with Ambassador Webson. Um, faces that, well, at least one face that will be known uh, to many of you already. That's Amanda Davis from the IAPB. And also one of our, please, please, come on, Amanda. Come on. And from the SNEC, Daniel Ting as well. Welcome, Amanda. Welcome up, Daniel. Please give him a warm round of applause. Good to see you. Please, come and have a seat. Now, now Amanda, worth, worth actually reflecting with such a brilliant group here, just on the sheer range of members across the IAPB. What do you think as you, uh, as you reflect on that range? Because you chair Western Pacific, but you see it firsthand. No, it's amazing. Such a buzz here today. It was actually hard to get into this room. Yeah. So many colleagues and friends. Um, there's over 100 delegates here today from uh, the Western Pacific, yeah. everywhere from Papua New Guinea, Pacific Islands, Vietnam, Cambodia, Philippines, Korea, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand. So yeah, really excited to yeah. see them here. Um, really diverse representation yes. from academia, yeah. um, our NGOs, um, our, our members, of yeah. course, hospital representation, so in our yeah. private sector. So we're sort of poised really to build on the ambassador's comments about building coalitions, working together, collaboration. Uh, Daniel, casting my mind over your role, you've got a pretty cool job. Just uh, give us a sense of what it involves. I want to talk about technology, but the big picture, I, I think I want to come and do work experience with you. Tell us what it involves. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. and. Um, and, um, you know, I think like um, the world has uh, undergone a, a really unfortunate but, uh, you know, uh, a period for the past uh, three years. And, and, and thankfully, I mean, you know, the crisis has, is over, but still, like, we need to be actually be better prepared for the next wave to come. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that I had a privilege to step into, like, technology and artificial intelligence and uh, after my PhD time. Um, and, and, and the PhD projects was really related uh, to diabetic retinopathy screening, to you know, looking at how we could uh, potentially democratize you know, the use of technology for many, many you know, the patients from all around the world, yeah. diabetic patients. And you know, we, we, we know like, uh, places like Africa, like what uh, Ambassador has uh, just uh, mentioned, one million population, if you only have three doctors to, um, to, uh, to look after the population, what, how are you even going to you know, talk about screening your eyes and things like that, right? So I think like uh, with the advent of uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning, of course now chat GPT, who doesn't, 
who doesn't, who hasn't heard of the chat GPT, you know, for the past two months? Like everyone is talking about generative AI and yes. stuff. How do you actually use it? Good. Yeah. And with your help, we want to cut through some of the noise, through the hype. We want to hear what you're experiencing yeah. firsthand. So th thank you, Daniel, for being here. Thanks, Ali. Um, Ambassador Webson, help please give us an overview of some of the work that's been done to elevate the importance of eye health globally. For example, the recent request, I know we've been working very closely as colleagues on, on the request for a UN envoy. Help us understand some of that work, please. Thank you very much, Ali. And, uh, if I might just place this, forgive me. I'll place that with you, sir. Yep. Thank you very much. And um, can you hear me? Yeah? yeah. Thank you very much. And um, you know, sometimes they work at the United Nations, so most people might seem far away. But we have been, um, back in 2018, we started the Friends of Vision together with colleagues from Bangladesh and Ireland. And you saw the, uh, the then ambassador from Bangladesh introducing the resolution. Mm. That was the very first time that a, resolu a standalone resolution on eye health was presented to the United Nations, which meant that outside uh, the WHO was, in, in 2020, they brought it to the floor and the WHO meant that the ministers of health globally were beginning to take so, and look and take responsibility yeah. for eye health. The, what the resolution did in 2021 was begin to give political bite yeah. behind this effort. And for the first time, as you saw at the beginning of the, in, the, the video, the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda was at the beginning of that video speaking about um, eye health and it began to have leaders beginning to take the address. So to, at the United Nations, we made other steps towards that. And last, early this year, we got over 75 members of the United Nations, almost two thirds, or, or just, or just, just almost 50%, yeah, almost 50% of the numbers of countries in the UN yeah. who signed on to this envoy. We're still working with the SG towards that. We believe that is going to be a major game changer. When we get that um, appointment, we are still working at it. Yeah, and on, on that appointment and hopefully speeding towards us, what's the biggest difference that would make? Just be as blunt as you like. <laughs> well, I think we, some of the things we're talking about in terms of, I think the most important difference is the, li is the life change it would make for millions of people yeah. in real sense because that's what it's about yeah. i think that's the real difference it would make what the appointment would do is get the attention of governments and leaders yes. prime ministers um policy makers health workers yeah. and get their attention because the sg role using his bully pulpit to get the attention of people would be taken seriously and i think finally what we, what we will use that position to do is to let people remove eye health from only being a health issue yes. and Pushing. see it as a developmental Development. issue. Right. 100%. Thank you. Amanda, casting our minds across some of the stories, across the network, help us to understand some of the highlights because it's been a brilliant couple of years. Well, it wasn't a brilliant few years before that. Um, obviously, and many people have mentioned um, COVID and the impact. And just to give that a bit of context, there's recently been a rapid review of 52 publications over 26 countries, mm. um, just looking at the impact of COVID on eye health. And I mean, no surprising results uh, for anyone here. Obviously, a, a huge decrease in referrals, huge decrease yeah. in um, cataract surgery. Um, People seeking uh, services obviously decreased, which led to you know additional complications for DR, um, increase in myopia, particularly in this region, and then training um, being impacted um, from that. But as uh, Jod had mentioned in his introduction, with every crisis comes that opportunity, and I think looking towards some of the new ways of, of doing things um, is a re is a real opportunity for us to sort of you know build back mm. uh, in a better way. Um, 
But from a regional perspective, we needed to get back to basics, to be honest, after COVID. What we found is that our members really needed to embrace, again, a strategy to really need to come together. Mm. Um, particularly that was felt at a national level mm -hmm. where obviously national coordination had dropped off. Yeah. A lot of the um, focal points and key leaders had been diverted into other roles during the pandemic. Yes. So it really was starting to get that coordination back yes, together. We had a incredibly successful meeting here um, um, under the leadership of Dr. Eric Domingo from WHO Wipro um, and with IPB in November last year. It was actually here in this auditorium. I think we're just about to wear out our welcome with Siri at yes. IPB. Um, but we had representation, um, 26 ministerial representations here, a lot of our members. Good. We had WHO regional and global. Yeah. And it was a great opportunity to bring the threads together and to start to really build that out right. again. Right, join, join those dots. Amanda, would you touch for us briefly on the Love Your Eyes campaign? That's one that many yeah. of us will have been yeah. uh, admiring. Love your eyes. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big hit in this region. We're always the first ones to greet World Sight Day over here where the sun comes up. Yeah. <laughs> um, last year was, uh, had particularly great results. We had the um, Ministry of Health in, Ma in Malaysia committed 250,000. Uh, eye tests in Shanghai was 750,000. So yeah. huge numbers. Mm. But what I want to make a point of is the actual catalytic capability of Love Your Eyes mm. because it's not just about that one awareness raising day. It has to be about that sustained yes. behavioral change. Yes. And a couple of examples of that in Cambodia, uh, the government has embraced that and is now looking at incorporating it into their national health promotion right. strategy. Um, and I believe in Brazil, they're looking at building out a month long awareness campaign. So it's actually building yeah. the sustained behavioral piece. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, sp speaking of awareness and action, Daniel, am I right in saying that Yes, you have a site day, but you also have a testing day here. Just, I, I think it helps. We're, we're very shy about blowing our own trumpet in the UK, but we, we're happy to shine a spotlight on what you're doing. Just remind us in Singapore. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Oli. Yeah, so um, we, Jot has uh, presented like, some of the work that we've done on the national screening program. Yeah. So, I mean, leveraging on um, the many years uh, worth of um, the the data that we collected as part of the screening program, that actually allows us to uh, kind of uh, quickly uh, jump onto you know, AI, machine learning, and deep learning to kind of uh, see how we could potentially leverage on technology to help democratize some of the screening services, improving the, um, the access to care right. to many patients, not just uh, within the Singapore region, but how we could actually potentially use this uh, sophisticated technology for the world population, for the uh, population where the access is, uh, you know, is an issue. For example, Africa again. Yeah. Um, this is something that uh, I think Singapore, as uh, you know, being one of the leading uh, eye institutions in the world, um, we, we see uh, a big role uh, that uh, you know we, we can play. And of course, I mean, you know, uh, speaking of the Chat GPT, generative AI, I, I just wanted to bring this back to the conversation again. Um, this is something that is uh, super hot. I mean, we mentioned about the London Tech Week. I'm pretty sure like everyone is uh, talking about chat GPT, generative AI. And I, I personally feel this is a very extremely powerful technology. Of course, now around the world, we call this as an AI race. And how do we quickly you know, uh, improve the education uh, among the low to middle income countries? Mm. Like uh, how, how, how can we actually you know, educate the the, the children, the next generations about the, mm. the use of technology, I personally feel generative AI could be a, a, a solution. So, so let's yeah. have, Daniel, if, if you would, let's have some examples of where you feel particularly some achievements, touching on AI if you like. Um, what would you draw our attention to? I'm looking for more specific examples, and then perhaps we'll get to any watch outs, things to be careful or cautious about. Yeah, so I mean, um, the conditions like diabetic retinopathy, we spoke about that. Myopia, we know is on a, on a rise. And I think these, these are some of the very key, uh, you know, the eye-related issues. Uh, of course, refractive errors. Ambassador yeah. talked about how 50% of the, 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 the children were, were not detected for refractive error, for instance. How could we actually use a simple solutions to actually detect these, you know, uh, put, uh, highly addressable, uh, you know, the yes. problems. So I think, uh, I mean, coming back to what uh, I mentioned earlier, using deep learning, using the automated way to classify, you know, the retinal imaging to screen for diabetes. Yeah. And 
in, in, in Seri, uh, we just published a paper two, two years ago in Lancet uh, Digital Health, looking at how we could uh, potentially use the retinal imaging mm. to predict some, uh, who are these, uh, who, who are those uh, children who is actually at risk of developing high myopia? Yeah. Could you, yeah. I, I suppose what, what we'd like to understand is we've seen such a rise in conversation around AI. In your personal experience, is that just a rise in public consciousness or have you seen recent developments in your work that you could draw our attention to? Well, like uh, I personally see, like um, you know, AI has been around. I mean, deep learning, uh, in in, spe uh, in specific, has been around for six to eight years, and we now actually seeing, um, you know, the, the the implementations of the you know the uh, these uh, sophisticated technology in the real world settings. So, uh, for example, U.S. has just approved like the three uh, diabetic retinopathy screening technologies uh, recently for the last uh, two to three years, and I think. Medicare is already starting to, um, you know, allow the billing uh, for yeah. all these uh, AI, you know, the automated, uh, you know, the classification system yeah. to screen for diabetic retinopathy. So, I mean, these are some of the things that we actually see the, the yeah, maturations and, uh, of the technologies in the real settings. Yeah. And, and just very briefly, Daniel, any, any cause for concern, maybe a note of caution, um, thinking about colleagues in the room, just, just watch outs that you've experienced firsthand. Well, I think challenges of the AI implementations. First, I think the data privacy, I think that yeah. is super important. So, I mean, again, going back to, you know, the generative AI, chat GPTs, how do you not want to actually, uh, you know, uh, ask the chat GPT about some sensitive patient's data? Yes. Uh, I think this is one of the things. Um, of course, the data interoperability. Yes. So if you actually build, uh, you know, the AI system, how do you actually, uh, you know, uh, once the AI system to be tested in the different population, how do you address the AI biases, the ethical considerations? I think these are some of the uh, big right. issues that we and, and, need and, to and think about. And in the yeah. ambassador's words, leaving no one behind. Um, I'd love to know what your questions are, what your observations are in the room. So why don't we open up our theme here, a fast moving future. But what are you placing on our agenda for the next couple of days? I'll take uh, questions. We've got about 12 minutes left. You can submit those online as well. Questions about things you've heard so far. What's top of your mind, guests? I see you in about the fifth row there. Is it Joyce there, I think? Yeah. Feel free to say where you're from, and you don't have to, but please, I'm looking around the room as well. Now, we'll just make sure that I can sort it, if that's all right. Sorry. Here we are. All right. Well done. Here we <laughs> oh, well done. That's great. Thank you. No. There it is, you're on. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. Right. right, good morning. My name is Joy Koech from CBM. And thank you, Ambassador Webson, for um, inspiring presentation. Um, extremely, you know, inspiring and a call to action as well. We must keep up with the global change, post-pandemic, and more transformational changes, such as climate change, and of course, the current um, economic crisis that we all have seen. Mm. Now, which have, of course, led to significant complexities in our landscape that we operate in. And my question is, what ways can we leverage this landscape, Ben, to reimagine approaches to eye health and to create more sustainable and equitable systems? Mm. Just, so just the very first bit of your question again, Joy, was, was it how do we create? What ways? In what ways can we leverage this landscape that we now operate in? to reimagine new approaches. Reimagining new health. approaches. Thank you, Joyce. Yes. Ambassador. Thank you, Joyce. That's a really good question. Um, I, believe one, I believe we have to work, we, as I said earlier, we have to see eye health not just as a health issue. We have to see it as a development issue. If we're going to tackle the problems that we are faced with, and we're going to reduce the numbers. You have to be seeing eye health as a challenge to education, as a challenge to employment, as a challenge to, uh, to addressing the question of poverty. If we only see eye health as a health issue, we will continue to work along the same lines in our same silos or simply yes. locked into health and, and not, not broadening the, the constituency towards employment. People are challenged if they think their jobs are in danger. People are challenged if they think their education is in danger. If they get the opportunity to re 
re restart and look at education and recognize that if they had better services, they can then become better educated. You will find they will have a, you will find that the broader community will embrace the question of eye health. Just one last point and, and, and a practical point within the context of, of eye health. If you're speaking of improving sanitation, not as an, only as an eye health issue, because if you improved water, if you improve in sanitation, you'll get rid of trachoma. And if we spoke of that in that context, rather than only uh, in the context of the disease, that's a big difference. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador. Amanda, why, why don't we just briefly pick up on that? Because you, you've spoken before about this idea of a systems approach, some systems thing. Just, just tell us what you mean by that. And then just, any examples on that? Because I think it does speak to our, our question as well. Yeah, um, and as Ambassador Webson has just talked about, it's you've got to think more broadly than just um, the eye health. So it's, it's really taking a whole of systems approach. And of course, that means working with very different stakeholders than what we've been working with. It takes a really bold leadership approach because it becomes a very proactive approach, not a reactive yeah. approach. Um, um, sorry, I think I'm, no, I'm back. Um, it, you know, it, it really becomes a, a, a way of learning yes. and, and also thinking about failures and yes. learning because you're talking about cause and effect. And um, recently, or well, probably a couple of years ago, um, Papua New Guinea embarked on a, um, a, a very um, interesting journey um, to do some very, very deep research around what was not just the eye health situation and the factors that are impacting eye health, but what are those other factors yes. in the system? So it took a whole of system research approach and um, that's now sort of been released and they're mapping through what that looks yeah. like. And one critical part has been, there's been a very strong PBL in Papua New Guinea for many, many years, very good group of people doing great things, but they've started to question, do we actually even have the right people in this room? Right, so that, that is exactly where my mind was going. So in terms of building a bigger table, empty chairs if you were casting that invitation way beyond this room who would we like to see joining us so I think you're looking at I mean obviously you know you've got all your different ministry representations you know you've got education you've got um, environmental you've got your financing you've got um, your disability sector you've got your youth service already here you mean no, the we need to build to be, a bigger to be, right, broader. I, I, I do think we've made progress okay. over the years. I do think people are looking differently. I do think with the, with the release of the Integrated People Centered Eye Care, it made people start to think okay. a bit differently. Could I, could I just Please, Ambassador. I think Amanda is, as they say, spot on. She's very correct. And I think the risk, I spoke of risk, taking risk. The risk is that the organizations who work in this field have to take the risk to go outside of the comfort zone and outside of what is healthcare and typically seen as healthcare okay. and begin to ask the question, who do we need in the room? Okay. What sort of research do we need to do to address the question? Let's say trachoma. Yes. Is the research about eye health or is the research about sanitation and water and cleanliness and so yes. on and so on? Now, on this, briefly, Daniel, what do you think will be big tech, if I can use that broad phrase's interest in eye health, and to what extent should we be embracing that interest or concerned by that interest? Any small clues that you've seen in Apple's new virtual reality headset? Some eye health <laughs> integration, but give us a sense and maybe you'll give us some food for thought in our coffee break as well. So feel free to provoke us as well. Yeah, I think like, um, you know, just a few concrete examples, like uh, you mentioned about the, um, the Apple Vision, like the VR, uh, you know, that, that's just been released like uh, one, two weeks ago. And of course, HoloLens 2, I think that that's something that's not, uh, not, not, not foreign to uh, many people here. I think the AR, VR, the uh, uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, how do you actually leverage on all these like um, emerging digital innovations to help patients with low vision, for instance. Yeah. How do you magnify the, um, you know, the visual field and to help people to see? I think this is one of the very cool and, and useful technology that I, I think many patients can benefit from. Of course, generative AI, that's the, the, the second one that I, I really want to, I know I've, I've actually mentioned this like multiple times because this is really like the thing that may potentially revolutionize what we actually been uh, is going to do for the next five, ten years, or many years right. to come. Yeah. So but I think but but Daniel, I, I want you to help us hit a home run on that because what's a real example of how generative AI, like ChatGBT, has made your life 
easier, helped you move faster? Because I, I want you to bring it to life, because I don't want it just hanging as a vague, attractive concept. Well, I mean, okay, I mean, just um, clinically speaking, um, we, 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 we are actually looking at a few, uh, you know, the uh, use cases, right? So the first is, how do you actually um, summarize the, the sea of the information yes. that you've seen um, to a really concrete and very organized uh, discharge summaries, for instance, right? This is one of the big, uh, you know, the um, use case that micro, uh, Microsoft OpenAI and Epic is currently trying to e mm. explore. They've announced a partnership in HIMSS. Um, that's, yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, the largest health informatic uh, the conference in the world yeah. in the United States. So I think that's one use case. Okay, uh, yeah. except though, for, forgive me for pushing back, but on the front page of ChatGPT, cautions around accuracy, that must concern you. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, ChatGPT has been trained on the uh, non-medical the, the data, yes. and you know, like, the data sets actually is up to 2021. And coming back to the healthcare settings, like, if, you, uh, I mean, the, 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 rap, the, the rapid, uh, you know, change in the medical information, the updated guidelines yes. and things, this is something that we also have to uh, be very, very ca uh, cautious about, yeah. the limitation of the technology that we talk, uh, uh, talked yeah. about. Helpful, yeah. helpful. Forgive me, I'm just going to... Look out for another question in the room or online. Why don't we go, yes, I see. Let's just take these final two and then we'll have time for a closing thought. Please, and then we'll go down one row in front. Please feel free to say where you're from. Welcome. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Dr. Ofel Alcantara from the Philippines. I used to be the mayor as well. So I'm putting things here. This is my first time. I'm really happy to be here. I, with this short open, opening, it's a lot of learnings that I already got. I'm looking at... Uh, the sharing to put in the landscape in four areas. One, the services using Love Your Eyes as an opportunity and as a health promotion strategy. Yep. We mentioned about a lot of global and uh, translating it international, but I may add, please put this in the local. What yep. we did with WHO is the social determinants for health in one of the provinces in the Philippines. And we, it's really very difficult to reach cataract, never mind, I'm already old. So these are all social determinants. Yes. And good that we are going beyond health, not just health issue, but develop yes. issue. Because there are only 20% that the health sector can respond, but 80% is beyond the health sector. Yes. So uh, what I'm so, uh, putting into landscape, the local, but I would like also to look at the system, especially, of course, AI, but farther in the local, the different type, the learnings that we have, the different types in the, uh, that we have uh, actually best practice that has been done in terms yes. of what kind of local health system. Thank you, thank yeah. you. And th this will fuel, and funny enough, bringing the Love Your Eyes campaign to life on a local level is on our agenda yes. for, this, for this gathering. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank for, let me, let's just take a very brief comment just from the row in front of you, if you don't mind, sir, please. Um, thank you, if you'd pass the yeah, Feel free to pass the microphone to our colleague who's standing. Thank you. And we'll just get a quick snapshot of what's on your mind, sir and then we'll have Thank to you wrap, please. Um, I am Bernard Agbo, I'm coming from Nigeria. And I want to thank uh, Ambassador for, for the point he made. It's actually, if we look at blindness um, as a development issue, um, it makes more sense. But I want to ask a question about artificial intelligence. Uh, the burden of blindness is in Africa and um, we know Africa has particular problems in terms of getting access to AI and IT related um, accessories and all of that. Yes. How do we leverage this? If we're going to do a global fight against Brilliant question, blindness. Sir. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. V very clear. F f forgive me. I'm going to give a brief come back to Daniel on that. And then I might ask the ambassador to close with a thought around this, this big conversation around collaboration, your, your words of encouragement to us, perhaps. Daniel, briefly on AI and our guest 
uh, for, from Africa? Yeah, uh, super important questions. I, I, I re uh, I'm really glad that this question is being asked. I think two things. I think we need to build a digitally AI-ready infrastructure. So before we even talk about AI or deployment or the use of AI, I think first the infrastructure needs to be ready for, um, uh, for, for the use of AI. So that's number one. Second is the, um, the educations. How do you actually educate the current the next generations about yes. what AI can do and the potential of AI. I think if you actually start with these two key elements, I think that that, that would you know, be the key. Yeah. Thank you. Ambassador, you've seen all sorts of organizations work well together, not work so well together. Your challenge to us on collaboration, briefly, sir. I think, I think the, the, the big challenge is, 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 what we, is what I said about risk. Mm. Organizations stepping out of the comfort zone we have to be, we have to be, to embrace a broader concept yeah. of what our vision, our mission is. So if we are about avoidable blindness, if we are about, um, say, addressing the question of the 1.1 billion, then we have to, we, we, we have to see it beyond healthcare. Yes. And I think a good title might be beyond healthcare. Yes, beyond healthcare. Yeah. Absolutely. Amanda, just a very brief final thought, particularly for our guests joining us for the first time. You've seen how to get the most from these gatherings. A, a, a final word, forgive me for making it very practical, but advice, because we want this to be a very, very worthwhile gathering for them. Uh, how about a challenge? Yeah. So, um, as Caroline said, we know what to do. We have great political momentum at the moment. We yeah. have the evidence. We have the tools. I would challenge that we need to go way beyond sharing our learnings, way beyond coordinated efforts and look at collective efforts, yeah. real collective efforts, yeah. thinking of pooled resources, more from just project partnerships, going that one step further yeah. and really thinking about how do we actually come together, yeah. collective strategies and collective implementation. Yeah, it's a great challenge, Ambassador Webson nodding in agreement. I'm sure that will have resonated. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Ambassador Webson, for getting us off to a fantastic start. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I felt as we come down there, we could have had a confetti moment to celebrate the anniversary, but perhaps a bit later. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, li listening to all of that um, is somebody who has had a keen eye across uh, all of these developments. That's because they are the Chief Executive of the IAPB. Uh, please welcome to the stage someone who may or may not have been frantically rewriting their speech as we've been talking, Peter Holland. <laughs> Good to see you, Peter. Oli, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to firstly add my welcome to everybody. It's fantastic to have so many people here, so many new people, so many old friends as well. So thank you so much for for making the journey and joining us uh, over these next two days. Um, I'd also particularly like to give a huge thanks to Professor John Mehta, uh, Professor Ong Ting, and the whole team here at the Singapore National Eye Centre and Singapore Eye Research Institute, who've worked so hard together with my team at IPB and Amanda, our regional chair, to ensure this event is, is gonna be, I'm sure, a great success. And, and a personal thanks to uh, Ambassador Webson, uh, who's for your inspiration and who's been such a powerful ad advocate for our cause. Thank you. Uh, and a final set of thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank the Singapore Tourism Board and all our change makers and uh, exhibitors who've really helped bring, uh, bring us here. George, uh, you said this event has probably been the longest uh, event in the making in IPB's history. I think it's five years since we first came and, uh, and talked about holding an event here in Singapore. And I'm really delighted that we're able to honour the commitment we've made to hold a global event here, no longer obviously constrained by the shadow of COVID. Um, we've heard around the challenges that the past years have brought us, and we've heard a lot around the challenges the lessons that have been learned. And I think from Amanda, we also heard about some of the things, the progress that has also been made and some of the ways that we've innovated as a sector. Um, I wanted to talk about one area, it's actually already come up a couple of times, but across the sector, we're engaging many, many more people 
in our efforts than ever before, raising the awareness uh, of, of eye health. And that, of course, has been through World Sight Day uh, and Love Your Eyes. And that's not just here in the Pacific region. Last year, there were over six million pledges for eye tests. There were 20 parliamentary screenings. And as we've already heard from the audience, many, many members participated with their own events and campaigns. Indeed, there's one person here who's so committed that they've got a tattoo of the Love Your Eyes logo on them. <laughs> and it's not me, but. <laughs> um, as we've heard from Ambassador Webson, we're continuing to make the case for eye health, not just as a health issue, but as a, uh, on the global agenda as a social, economic, and development issue. Last year, it was eye health was included in the UN resolution on road safety, and the Commonwealth heads of government, uh, government meeting renewed their commitment to high health across the Commonwealth. But the challenge now, and as we've already heard this, the challenge now is to take those global commitments and implement them at national level, and indeed right down to local level. And that's the challenge that we're all involved in. We know we need to accelerate our efforts. The goal of 2030 Insight is ambitious. It's to achieve a world where no one experiences unnecessary or preventable sight loss so that everyone can achieve their full potential. To do so, we must elevate vision and embed it as a fundamental social, economic and development issue. And we must integrate eye health into wider healthcare systems. We must activate demand for eye care by driving patient, consumer and market change. That means working differently. And one difference this year is that for the first time, more than half of our speakers at an IPB global event are women. I'm really proud that we've been able to. And I want to just touch on three themes. These are themes that actually have already come up in the discussions, but the themes that we will be considering over the next couple of days. Firstly, the scale of the challenge. We know the scale of the challenge, but that actually means we have to respond in way and find ways that meet that scale. So our responses have to be of a similar scale. One of those challenges is refractive error. And I'm absolutely delighted that we're joined by Dr. Alarco Cieza and the team from uh, WHO, who are going to be contributing across the program. But in particular tomorrow, they'll be running a session on SPECS, the World Health Organization's new initiative on refractive error. I, I, really, well, I really welcome it because WHO's leadership is going to be critical in tackling what's a growing public health crisis. The partnership approach they're proposing is critical to eliminating unrec uncorrected refractive error and needs us to work together and draw on all the resources, skills and expertise of the public, private and non-governmental sectors. And that leads me to the second theme, which has been mentioned particularly by Ambassador Webson. We have to work in partnership. We have to collaborate with each other, but critically beyond the sector. We can't just rely on governments to achieve our goals. I'm delighted that in sessions such as tomorrow's plenary session on eye health and the world of work, which is also our World Sight Day theme this year, and today's session on business in action, we'll be joined by speakers from business and from outside the sector exploring how leaders, wherever they work, can take responsibility for eye health. And finally, we have to hold ourselves accountable. As you'll know, in 2021, the World Health Assembly set two global targets on effective cataract service and refractive error coverage. Last year, the World Health Organization published the first baseline reports on these targets. We'll be discussing this data and its implications in the global target session straight after the break. But let me give you a spoiler. The data showed that only 17%, one in six, uh, six people who needed a cataract operation, got access to one and got a good quality outcome. One third of those who got a cataract operation had a poor outcome. We know there's a huge challenge on access, but I think the wake up call for us is also on quality. We can address this. We've got the technology, we've got the knowledge, and we now have the data but it's now on us to change those figures, make sure that everyone is not only getting the access to the services they need, but, access, but getting access to services that are good enough to meet their needs. 
We've got a lot to do, and I hope we can use these two days to take the agenda forward. I hope you find them thought-provoking, challenging, and fun. I've highlighted a few components of a really rich program, and that's just the main sessions. But of course, the real work often gets done outside in the breaks and the lunches uh, and the events like this. So I encourage you to be inspired, to connect with each other, and to take action so that together we can build a world where no one experiences unnecessary or preventable sight loss. Thank you.